So now, without any further ado, let me introduce Marilis Tomister, she's from Tomis to Tomister, and now, uh, and uh, she's, uh, she has a master's degree in law and philosophy, she cooperates from time to time with the University of Tartu, and now she will talk about her perspective on the travel that she has recently uh, had. So, welcome her with the <laughs> Hello. Uh, there is a saying in Ethiopia that just because you have two legs, it doesn't mean you have to try to climb two trees at the same time. But as I stand here, I will make an attempt to use my two legs and climb the two trees at the same time by speaking about law and uh, folklore at the same time. Uh, this is really a, a very welcome opportunity for me because, as Stefana said, I also cooperate with the university a little bit. I have a course, Basics of Law, and it's my quest to make law interesting for students. So this is a good chance for me to practice even more. In the beginning, why did I bring up Ethiopia at all? It's because just two weeks ago, on the 1st of December, Early in the morning, I was standing in the Tallinn airport waiting for my backpack, which, uh, which was filled with Ethiopian coffee and hiking boots. I was just returning from Ethiopia. As you can see, even when I travel, I can't leave the lawyer part of me behind. It's the Mekele University Department of Law and Legal Aid. And uh, throughout the speech, please just have a look at the photos. They are here to maybe give you a little insight to what I saw in Ethiopia. I will try to move around a little bit so everybody can get a look at the photos. And, yeah. Uh, Ethiopia in itself is a really fascinating country because it's, uh, for example, it's said to be the only African country that has never been colonized by Europe. At this point, as almost every speaker already has today, I will have to bring in Italians because there was a little bit of confusion for a couple of years when the uh, Ethiopians managed to successfully repulse the Italian invasion. <laughs> but other than that, they... Well, colonization, let's call it how it was. Yes, <laughs> let's call it colonization. But other than that unfortunate event, the Ethiopians got to uh, keep their very rich cultural traditions. And these traditions have reached, have reached even, well, we, we can see, still see the traditions nowadays. One part of these traditions belongs to the Oromo people. The Oromo people make up around uh, one third of the Ethiopians. Uh, they are the largest ethnic group of Ethiopia, and they speak the Roma language. And sin, for, since, I think, the 16th century, uh, they have had a very specific uh, system. We have uh, corporations, contracts, rights, powers, etc. They are all abstract. But these abstract constructs are uh, not there in the traditional legal systems. For example, the traditional legal systems in Africa. Uh, the traditional systems are more based on natural law, on the everyday business, on the way people uh, go around their relationships with other people, and they are not about finding out who is right and who is wrong. They are, if there is a conflict, these systems uh, try to reconciliate the parties. Uh, this kind of uh, reconciliation is very well seen in the Oromo court system. They have the governance structure that is called the GADA system. GADA is pretty much an umbrella term for, for, for the society there. And in the GADA system they have um, assemblies. The assemblies are called BAKU and the assemblies 
are made up of uh, people from uh, the most important families around one region. Uh, these people are, uh, well, they form different generation groups. One generation groups is, uh, well, one generation in uh, eight years. And uh, all these groups have their different uh, political and uh, judicial functions. Uh, if you are in a Ibaku assembly, then you inherit the position from your father. Every four years, the eldest son of the important man becomes a member of the assembly. But what is most interesting for us is that every two weeks, these uh, Baku, Baku, sorry, the Baku assemblies come together and function as courts of law. Uh, they address the various uh, daily business of the peasants because the Oromo people mainly are peasants. Uh, right now there's around uh, 30 million of the Oromo people and 95 of them lead a very archaic lifestyle. They deal with agriculture, they have a lot of cattle, they, they really live in those nice clay huts and uh, sadly enough they sometimes live at subsistence level. What is more, they don't speak the language that uh, the so-called western style legal system in uh, Ethiopia uses, that's the Amharic language. The Oromo people, they just speak Oromo. So they don't really go to the usual courts in cities if there is something wrong, if someone has wronged them. They go to these Baku assemblies. Uh, and the Baku assemblies, they don't have the punishments like imprisonment. They don't have corporal punishment also. It's a civilized country. But uh, they usually use some fees that one person has to pay another. Or also they have uh, religious recon reconciliation methods just ask for forgiveness, everything will be okay. And uh, in this way, people solve their everyday problems. So that's, that's the African traditional way. But I think there's a better way to illustrate this than just me talking about the theoretical background. Uh, in the beginning of this event, I remember Christina promising us that there would be a thousand stories well, I can only tell you one. Uh, this is um, an Ethiopian and Oromo uh, folk tale about going to court. And I think it illustrates quite well their way of thinking. It has a kind of a bizarre logic for us, maybe, but let's see. Let's try it. The tale is called uh, The Dog Fight. Uh, once there was a very old wise man living in a village and he saw that two dogs were fighting. The dogs belonged to the man's neighbors. He was looking at the dogs and uh, he told the other people around them, listen to me, somebody go separate the dogs, otherwise the boys will be fighting. No one listened to the old man, no one cared. In a little while, one of the boys who owned one of the dogs came out of the house and saw my dog is being attacked by another dog. So the boy went to the dogs and hit the other dog. At the same time, the other boy from the other house who owned the other dog came out also, got really angry, and thus the boys began fighting. The very wise old man saw that the boys were fighting and he said, someone please go separate the boys, otherwise the mothers will be fighting. But no one again listened to the boy, so in a little while, one of the mothers came out and saw that somebody was beating her son. She rushed in there and hit the other boy. Of course, this was seen by the other boy's mother. Thus it happened that the mothers began fighting. The very wise old man said, no, you see what's happening. Please, someone separate the mothers, otherwise their husbands will be fighting. 
And of course, that's what happened. One of the husbands came out, saw his wife being attacked, went in there, struck the other woman. The other woman's husband also seeked revenge. The wise old man was looking at the situation and said, now this is, this is going far. Someone go separate these men, otherwise uh, their clans will begin to fight. Of course, this is exactly what happens. The clans began to fight. There was a small war between the clans and on both sides, eight men were killed. After the war was over, the elders were called to resolve the conflict. There was a fight, we have to deal with it now. According to the tradition in that region, if a man was killed for this man to the other clan, uh, the killer either had to pay 1,100 cattle or a man on the other side had to be killed. So the elders sat around and thought, look, if you're going to exchange a hundred cattle for every man that was killed, we're going to have to give away 800 cattle on both sides. This is a loss of 1,600 cattle. We can't, we can't do that. The other option is to kill eight men on both sides because eight men on both sides were killed. This will be a loss of 16 additional men all in all, 32 men, no, we can't do that. There is simply no way to find a solution according to our customs here. At that time, the old wise man again passed by and said, what is going on here? How can I help? Well, he was given an overview of what had gone on. The two Dogs had been fighting, then the boys, then their mothers, then their husbands, then the whole clans. Eight people on both sides were killed and solution was nowhere to be found. And the old wise man listened to the story and he said, let me give you a solution. Yes, please, what is the solution? We really need a solution. There is no solution here. So he said, what I want you all to do is to take two silver necklaces from both clans, go to the river, drop them in the river. Then just let bygones be bygones and forgive each other. Thus justice was found. So this is kind of a strange logic. As a Westerner, I think you might have found several other ways that already maybe were the solutions. Why, why is there a problem if you have to give 1,600 cattle and get back 1,600 cattle? There is no problem, but for some reason this logic didn't function. What did function was the solution of dropping the silver necklaces into the water because everybody felt that this is fair. This is the, one of the differences between the, well, our legal culture and those that still rely on the society and the society's feeling of justness. There needn't always be the logic that we know. If you listen to the story as an Estonian or as anyone from the European legal cultures, then you might have, uh, well, had several of those abstract notions popping up to your mind. Let me maybe start with cruel treatment of animals, exhibiting violence to minors, all the crimes that actually happened in the process, breach of public order, of course, fighting. But uh, when we think about the law of the jungle, this is basically the, well, what the law of the jungle is about. It's uh, not the survival of the fittest, which is maybe what we might think at first sight. It's, it's uh, uh, an agreement between people, between the parties, to just find a solution and not go into who was <coughs> right, who was wrong. And um, maybe this is sometimes something 
We should also think about in our legal tradition, when we go, when there is something wrong, then the obvious solution is to go to a court and ask for a solution. Who did something wrong? Who is right? This means that people themselves give away some of the responsibility that they actually have for their actions. Uh, this uh, doesn't sound so bad when everything is okay. The state just takes the power of adjudicating upon itself. The people don't have to be in that process so much. There is a prosecutor, the victim doesn't really have a say in what punishment the prosecutor gives the accused. But, um, but on the other side, this can lead to a situation that has been talked about a lot in Estonia and, and in Europe, the uh, notion of legally correct. Something is just legally correct. This is the decision. It doesn't matter whether the society feels that it's correct or not. The decision goes like that. And this also opens a way for, well, going past the laws, going past morality going past the agreements that exist in the society. This can't happen really in case of uh, such conflict resolution that only takes to account the parties and what they feel about it and how they are okay with the resolution. This only can happen when you have the word of law and you, you go by it to the very letter. Uh, there is maybe the breach that we were looking for. If I ask you a rhetorical question that has also been asked in the Estonian media quite a lot, uh, it's, uh, it concerns uh, criminal proceedings. Of course, there is the prosecutor, there is the public uh, hearings, everything has to be very public, but there is also another option, that's the settlement proceedings. You never know what went on uh, between the parties. They have reached a settlement, there is a punishment, you know that someone maybe got three years for something, but uh, the judge did actually not take part in uh, coming up with the uh, punishment. The judge was there, he was listening to what was going on between the parties, the parties themselves find a solution, and that's that. That is where the so-called law of the jungle comes into play with our own legal system also. There are some people who are not okay with that. They feel that everybody should have the same measure of justice, that there should be no, no room for negotiation. Well, I think if we look inside ourselves, we find quite a few different answers and uh, different angles to look, look at it. So I think that's something we should all think about for a little while during these dark evenings of December in Estonia. I hope you enjoyed the photos. At least you could see that there's always some place where there is summer, even when we have, we have December here. And on the next photo, I think you will see Bye bye Ethiopia, we are leaving this topic and I think that's it from me. I would like to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marilu.